why you're taking the polygraph test? Because I want to prove to everybody that's against me. Two victims. One lost her innocence as a child. The first time that he had sex with you, sexual intercourse, uh, do you remember where you were and what happened? The other had to prove his innocence from behind bars. Unless you're 100% sure that you can answer those questions completely true, he doesn't want you to take the test. Okay, that's it. A polygraph from prison launched an effort for him on the outside. A new set of eyes that found the jury didn't hear the whole story. We tried in vain to present that to the jury, and the judge shut us down at every corner. And found others who should have been questioned. I did have sex with her, mm -hmm. and I'm not proud of it. It just wasn't fair. 16 years later, the wrong has been righted, but at a heavy price. I was so angry, you know, when I first got convicted. And what about the others? Will they face consequences? They told me, oh, uh, don't worry, she can't, you know, they're not going to prosecute you because the statute of limitation is over. I think somebody was protecting him. A Hawaii News Now special report, Innocence Lost. Sending an innocent man to prison to protect others. A girl victimized for years accused a military man of child sex assault, even though he didn't do it. Others involved with the girl were never investigated. Instead, the man fighting for our freedom was forced to fight for his own for 16 years. You know, I love the military, I love the Navy, and I was going to take it as far as it was going. Ronis Dural was 18 years old when he went to boot camp in 1993. In his 10 years as a sailor stationed at Pearl Harbor, he received awards and stellar evaluations. One described him as a superb leader and supervisor. Another called him an invaluable member, constantly producing outstanding results. In 2001, after September 11th, Dural deployed to the Persian Gulf. That's when the accusations came in. Being that young and some older guy is showing you that kind of attention. Mm -hmm. I guess I started to feel special. Dural's accuser, the daughter of a woman he dated years earlier. Uh, she came to me telling me she thought she was pregnant. And when I asked who was it, she wouldn't say anything. And the first person I, I actually named was Nate. And it's her stepfather. It's her stepfather, yeah. So you named Nate? I named him. I named him twice. The girl denied it. So the mother named the boys in the neighborhood or from school. When I got to Ronis, she got quiet. The mother took the silence as confirmation and filed a report with Honolulu police. The first HPD detective declined to pursue Dural. A year later, another detective, Cheryl Sunia, took the case. On January 29, 2003, Dural's ship, the USS Port Royal, pulled into Pearl Harbor. Before he even disembarked, he was told something was wrong. I was about to go to an evolution, but they said, you can't go. And I didn't understand why. He was ready to see his wife and young children. Instead, he was escorted off the ship. Detectives arrested him in the parking lot. That's when he learned he was charged with multiple counts of child sex assault. He was appointed public defender Walter Rodby. He thought the judge was going to give him a fair trial. I was hoping we would get a fair trial. But at trial, Rodby says the defense wasn't aware of other key pieces of evidence and information. 
The mother of the girl had recently caught her with a 26-year-old man who worked at her school cafeteria, Waimanalo Elementary and Middle School. The girl admitted the sexual relationship with that man was ongoing. They were on my living room floor. They said it was kind of going on for two years. The mother says she told Honolulu police about the incident, fearing it also qualified as sex assault. But she says law enforcement ignored it to pursue the case against Durong. No DNA evidence, no eyewitnesses. Dural's conviction came down to his word against his accusers. It's a sex assault case and we were assigned to a judge that had a strong bend for the prosecution. If there ever was an issue that was a close call, the judge would side with the prosecutor. Prosecutors kept the victim's involvement with the other man a secret, and in Hawaii, the law shields victims from having to talk about their sex lives. So Circuit Court Judge Karen Ahn would not allow Rodby to bring up the possibility of other suspects, not even the mom's list of potential suspects. At trial, we, we wanted to talk about that, that mom honestly thought that if there was any type of sexual activity going on, there was a long list of people prior that, that she felt would, was more suspect. We tried in vain to present that to the jury, and the judge shut us down at every corner. Still, Dural was certain a jury wouldn't send an innocent man to prison. I was so angry. You know, when I first got convicted, when I heard the guilty verdict, you know, I hear my wife at the time make a sound and I look back and see her crying with my kids. I remember the day that he went in for our sentence. <laughs> he took it like a man. He really did, it was ridiculous. He walked into the courtroom, he was taken away in chains. and he never complained to me. Durall went from dress whites to a khaki prison uniform. The once decorated Navy man with a promising career was now a convicted child rapist. You get in your lane and you stay in your lane. Still ahead, it's not easy in prison for those convicted of crimes against children. How he survived unscathed, plus, the Hawaii Innocence Project joins his fight for freedom, what Dural had to do to win their backing. Do you intend to be completely truthful with me about that? Yes. And the accuser's videotaped polygraph. I just really hated him, and I couldn't stand to look at him because I was so disgusted. and disgusted with myself, too, that I would let it happen, and I wouldn't. And we're talking about who now? The disturbing details she reveals. Who was really involved? That's all ahead in this special report, Innocence Lost. Ronis Dural was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was 28 years old at the time. The next eight years were spent fighting not just the conviction, but the prisoners around him who didn't take kindly toward convicted child predators. I got jumped by 11 guys in there. Um, I never backed down from anyone. I never was afraid one day. I was just angry and I was bitter. Dural served his time at OCCC, Halava, prisons in Arizona and Mississippi. In 2005, he wrote to the Hawaii Innocence Project, hoping they would help him. And so when there's no DNA that shows that your client is scientifically excluded, how do you determine, is this person really innocent? 
Because there was no physical evidence in Durall's case to prove his innocence, he was asked to take a lie detector test administered by famed polygraph examiner Jack Tremarco. I'm a former FBI agent, a very, very credible examiner. And that's who you want, especially if, if your goal, as it is here, is to seek the truth. Wearing his prison scrubs, Durall took the test in the visiting room at Saguaro Correctional Center in Arizona. So I don't want you to just take this test on the chance that you're going to pass or the chance that you're going to You have to be 100% sure that so you can pass this test. Okay? Are you? That's yes, a good. Yeah. There were only two questions that concerned the Innocence Project. Did you ever touch for sexual purposes? No. Did you ever touch sexually? No. A score of plus four or higher indicates the person is telling the truth. Dural's score, plus 10. That got him a firm backing from the Hawaii Innocence Project and access to valuable resources. The Hawaii Innocence Project is made up of lawyers, high-powered defense attorneys who donate their time, and students from the University of Hawaii Law School. In 2005, the group began examining the Dural case, reviewing transcripts from the trial, questioning the witnesses, and they asked his accuser to also take a polygraph. Jack Tremarco was hired again to administer her test. Before it begins, he seems to notice inconsistencies in the girl's story. Previous testimony showed Dural was assaulting the girl when she was 12, but she describes inappropriate behavior that began earlier when she was just 10 years old. Um, well, he wanted me to touch him when I was in the shower, and I told him no, and then uh, he said he wanted to show me something. Tremarco lets her talk for a while. I just really hated him, and I couldn't stand to look at him because I was so disgusted. and disgusted with myself, too, that I would let it happen. Seemingly confused by the scenario, Tremarco asks her a key question. And we're talking about who now? We're talking about... Um, about Nate, okay? Nate? My mom's husband. Nate is the stepfather, the man her mother named years earlier. He was the person she thought of as assaulting her daughter. This revelation prompts Trimarco to bring her back to Ronis Dural and her accusations against him. If you weren't telling the truth about him having sex with you, would you feel that you were in jeopardy either in a civil situation or a criminal situation for making a false statement? Yeah. After about an hour of discussion, the lie detector test is prepped. The test is about to begin. The actual exam doesn't take long. Trimarco asks just a handful of questions. Regarding if you ever had sexual intercourse with Ryan Durrell II, do you intend to be completely truthful with me about that? Yes. Not in connection with this case, have you ever lied to get out of trouble? No. Did you ever have sexual intercourse with Durrell? Yes. Not in connection with this case, have you ever lied to someone who loved or trusted you? No. Did you have sexual intercourse with Doral before your 15th birthday? Yes. Not in connection with this case, have you ever lied about something really important? No. A score of negative four indicates the person is being deceptive. The girl's polygraph results, a negative eight. According to the examiners and the Innocence Project, she was either confused or lying. Coming up, not just Nate. What about the other man who was caught with the girl on the living room floor? In his own words... They told me, oh, um, don't worry, she can, you know, they're not going to prosecute you because the statute of limitation is over. What he told the Honolulu police detective and what she did with the information. And 
Despite all this, the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office could put Dural on trial again. Will they continue to pursue the man they already wrongfully convicted? That's all ahead in this special report, Innocence Lost. Six years after Ronis Derwall was convicted of sexually assaulting a teen, the effort to win his freedom was gaining momentum. Witnesses recanted, lie detectors raised more than reasonable doubt, and then a man who once worked at the girls' school willingly told police that he had a long-term sexual relationship with her that started when she was 14. Today's date is 5-22-09, that's all right. The time now is approximately 4.35. That's the voice of former Honolulu Police Detective Cheryl Sunia interviewing Chad Kalawaya. Sunia investigated and helped convict Ronis Dural six years earlier. Okay, and you are employed where? Waimanalo Elementary Intermediate. Okay, and where? what do you do there? I'm a baker. Kalawaya says he and the girl started dating right after she turned 14 years old. Okay. But that's the first time I, I kissed her. It's December 31st of 2000. Okay. On the recording, he admits the relationship turned sexual in 2001 when she was still 14. He was 26 years old at the time. I did have sex with her. Mm -hmm. And I'm not proud of it. I did mm -hmm. have sex with her. I was wrong for what I did. I said, but I did make things right with, with myself, with the family, and with my God. Kalawaya says he was disciplined as a Jehovah's Witness. It was for me having sexual relations with <laughs> not because she was underage, but because we were mad. I mean, okay. we weren't mad. Okay. But Ken Lawson of the Hawaii Innocence Project says she was underage. I don't believe he knew that the law had changed in July 2001. Uh, because what he's trying to say is, I waited until after she was 14 to engage in sex, right? Now he's saying this uh, at the time that the law had already changed to 16, and unbeknownst to him, it's a crime. And court documents support that claim. Detective Sunia had all this information, but did not pursue. We asked her why the case did not switch from Dural to Kalawaya. She declined our requests for comment. Three years after Kalawaya's recorded interview with police, another man came forward recanting his trial testimony, the girl's stepfather, Nate. And we're talking about who now? We're talking about, um, about Nate, okay? Nate? My mom's husband. Okay, and what's his last name? Slutter. Okay. Nate Slutter. In a handwritten, notarized letter dated March 21st, 2013, Slutter admits that his testimony during Dural's trial 10 years prior was misleading and inaccurate, that he and the girl's mom knew about her relationship with Chad Kalawaya. The letter says they told the prosecutor about it, but he writes that they were told the information wasn't necessary, wouldn't help the case, and that it was best to leave that information out. He says, a misuse of my testimony led to the wrongful incarceration of Dural and hopes to help clear his name and gain his freedom. The letter, which became Exhibit C in the court case to vacate Dural's conviction, then takes a stunning turn. His own statements appear to support the girl's accusations from her polygraph. He would touch me mm -hmm. and um, try to make me touch him. The handwritten statement Slutter Sign says, I too had an inappropriate relationship with the girl that was also sexual in nature. It goes on to say, one reason he didn't bring it up, he was afraid of being prosecuted and wanted to stay clear of incriminating myself. Both Slutter and Kalawaya declined our requests for comment. While neither man was ever prosecuted, the girl's mother feared being punished for coming forward. She was the first witness to recant her testimony.
On June 5th, 2009, the mother of the girl received a voicemail. Hi, this is Detective Sunia from HPD. I need to let you know that I have initiated a perjury case for your, in regards to your declaration. I was being questioned when I was coming forward to say, well, no, this isn't the truth. Uh, the detective, Sunia, said she was going to have me uh, draw perjury charges up on me and have me arrested. The girl's mother says she was angry and felt like she was being harassed for admitting that she gave false testimony about Dural because she trusted her daughter when the accusations were made. I was so torn between going against having to go against my child, and if we did, I have to do the right thing. I have to fix it. This is just wrong. She says recanting has had a permanent effect on her relationship with her daughter. The girl even referred to the strained connection during the polygraph. D does she love you? Do you love her? I did love her, and I thought she cared about me, but, um, I really feel like a mother wouldn't do this to her own daughter. The mother says Detective Sunia did not pursue perjury charges for whatever reason, but she's also puzzled that the police and prosecutor's office did not go after the two men who admitted to having inappropriate relationships with her daughter. I think they just wanted to, didn't want to say they got the wrong person and they wanted to just hold the conviction. People don't want to admit that what they did was wrong. Right? In order to justify that I didn't do anything wrong, I being a police detective or being a prosecutor, I'm going to keep forcing this issue. Instead of releasing Durall, the prosecutor's office offered him a plea deal. He could go home with credit for time served, but would have to admit to a misdemeanor crime. Well, when they offered the deal, it was, wasn't even a, you know, I didn't even consider it. You know, that's the day that I, I lost faith in the system. You know, up until that point, I just figured, you know, I was lied on and, you know, I have to just prove my innocence some way and I was just fighting to do that. But once we presented everything that I thought would get me released and they offered me the plea deal, I lost faith in the system. Durrell refused to admit to any crimes that he didn't commit. He walked back to his cell that night deflated, but not defeated. It would be another year before he was able to leave prison. In 2011, Dural was paroled. It had been eight years. While he was locked up, he and his wife divorced, his father died, his children were now teenagers. When my daughter sees me for the first time, she doesn't know who I am. He worked to build a relationship with his kids. He remarried and got a job and would spend the next eight years on parole. Earlier this year, the state Supreme Court upheld a lower court's ruling. Dural's conviction was overturned. I'm in prison for something I didn't do. He speaks to University of Hawaii law students about his 16-year fight with the system, a fight that isn't over yet. The Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Office can retry the entire case, or they can dismiss it. A spokesman says they are still deciding their next move. Another trial has been scheduled for December 2nd, and Dural is still a registered sex offender. The Hawaii Innocence Project will work to get that removed. And what about the other men, Nate Slutter and Chad Kalawaya? There is no statute of limitations on child sex assault, but as far as we can tell, no law enforcement agency ever made a case. Chad Kalawaya still works at a school. According to the Department of Education, he remained at Waimanalo Intermediate until November of 2015. After he left, he went to the Big Island and is currently at Keao Middle School, again working in the cafeteria. The girl's mother sent letters to DOE officials but says she never got a response writing to the school and, and going to the district uh, superintendent and trying to get a predator like that who's admitted to having done this. In a statement, a spokesperson for the DOE says they thoroughly investigated the allegations against Kalawaya, 
due to employee privacy policies, they are limited in the information they can share. But based on witness testimony and insufficient evidence, the department says they were unable to substantiate the claim. Ron Estoral has rebuilt his life. He's remarried, is close to his now grown kids. State law allows those wrongfully imprisoned to receive $50,000 for every year they spent behind bars. But there's a catch. The person has to be declared innocent in court. The presumption of innocence, which Doral has right now, is not enough. It's a flaw in the law that the legislature passed in 2015. Since then, not one exoneree has been able to get any money. For Hawaii News Now, I'm Lynn Kawano.